You're listening to YAP, Young and Profiting Podcast, a place where you can listen, learn, and profit. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. My goal is to turn their wisdom into actionable advice that you can use in your everyday life, no matter your age, profession, or industry. There's no fluff on this podcast, and that's on purpose. I'm here to uncover value from my guests by doing the proper research and asking the right questions. If you're new to the show, we've chatted with the likes of ex-FBI agents, self-made billionaires, sleep psychologists, CEOs, and best-selling authors. Our subject matter ranges from enhancing productivity, how to gain influence, the art of side hustles, and more. If you're smart and like to continually improve yourself, hit the subscribe button because you'll love it here at Young and Profiting Podcast. This week on Yap, we're chatting with Monty Moran, the former co-CEO of Chipotle and former CEO of the law firm Messner and Reeves. While at Chipotle, Moran led a team of more than 75,000 employees and helped to grow the company from eight locations to more than 2,000. He was key to the massive explosion of Chipotle across the U.S. in the late 2000s. Currently, Monty is a chairman on corporate boards, an advisor to many startups, and a new author. His first book, Love is Free, Guac is Extra, comes out tomorrow, October 20th. In today's episode, we have a ton to cover, so much that I've made this a two-part series. In part one, we'll discuss Monty's early career journey and how he ended up being the co-CEO of Chipotle after being a lawyer for 10 years with no food industry or real estate experience. And then in part two, we'll go super deep into his expert leadership strategies, including his perspective on creating a great company culture, his top ways to connect with people, and how you can design a mission that will motivate employees to do their best work. <laughs> hey, Monty, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Hey, thanks so much. Glad to be here. We are very excited to talk with you. You've had a very fascinating career journey. You were formerly the co-CEO of Chipotle during its massive growth period from 2008 to 2016. And it was under your watch that the organization expanded from eight restaurants to 2,000 globally. So you've got a really extraordinary career path. You started as a lawyer, then you became, you know, managing director, CEO of a, a priority law firm um, or premier law firm, I should say. And, you know, that's a very unique career path going from lawyer to managing a law firm to then becoming the CEO of Chipotle. So help us connect those dots there. How did you end up becoming the, the co-CEO of Chipotle, getting that role there, um, you know, coming from a lawyer background? It just seems like a very unique career path. Yeah, I think it is a unique career path. Um, really, it, uh, you know, I was a lawyer in Los Angeles for a few years. And uh, during that time, my friend Steve Ells had start, had founded Chipotle back in Denver. And he had opened the first store and he and I just sort of, sort of stayed in touch during that time. And during weekends, I'd come back and I'd eat the incredible food he was making there. And at that time, he was working personally at the restaurant. And uh, the food was just unbelievable. It was like way too good for a burrito. And so I was, <laughs> I was really proud of what he had done there. And, and so um, after a, a few years practicing in LA, I, uh, I got married and wanted to come back to Colorado to, to raise my family in Colorado. And so came back to Colorado and uh, started, uh, got a job at a, at a law firm in Denver. And I was, I think, the eighth lawyer at that law firm. Um, and it was an associate position. Um, and then I started working um, as a lawyer. And during that time, I, I started developing uh, clients at the law firm. I, I basically worked my way up and very quickly became a partner of that law firm um, after about a couple of years and then became CEO of that law firm after a few years. And uh, so as CEO of the, of the law firm, I was really working, I mean, I was working hard on my own cases as a lawyer, but I was also working really hard to build a culture in the law firm because I was, uh, there were so many clients coming my way and I got busier and busier and busier. And I basically started to figure out I couldn't handle all the work. Mm. And so I had to hire more people. And when I'd hire more people, um, yeah, uh, I, 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 my clients got mad, you know, when I started giving the work to other people and they'd say, Hey, I want you to do my work. I want you to do, why, why are you slacking off on my work? Why are you giving it to associates? Don't you, don't, don't, don't I matter to you anymore? And that kind of thing. And what's really funny is that initially that felt really good to me mm -hmm. that they wanted me to do all their work. It was like, Oh, well, cool. I'm glad you like me, you know? And, uh, uh, so my ego was sort of warmed by those comments, but, but at the end of the day, I was getting way too busy to do all their work. And I really needed to get the help of associates to do the work. And so um, 
what happened was uh, something had to give, you know, either I would have to start saying no to new clients, which I didn't want to do because I was building a really neat law practice, or I would have to find a way to have my clients be happy with working with uh, junior associates. Mm -hmm. And, and so basically the thing that had to give was my ego. You know, I had to be like, okay, I got to be glad if clients like and want other people to work on their cases and, mm -hmm. and are happy to have me off their case. Um, and that's really counterintuitive for a young lawyer who was working really hard to build a practice, right? Because the way you become a partner of a law firm these days isn't like 30 or 40 years ago when you just hang in there. Uh, time doesn't get you there. Most of the time you have to develop a book of business. You have to develop your own clients and, and bring that value to the law firm. And that's what I had done. Um, but in order to develop even more clients past the amount of work I was able to do in a you know, 24 hour day, um, I had to make sure that clients were happy to have other people do the work. So in order to do that, I had to uh, do a lot of things very differently. I had to empower the associates at the law firm to uh, become, you know, to, to have a direct relationship with the client. Now, most of the time, partners in law firms like myself would not do that because they'd be afraid if they allowed the young associate to have a direct relationship with the client, that then that young associate could take the client and leave and go form their own law firm if it was a big enough client, or they could take a few clients and leave and start their own law firm. And that was very, very common that young lawyers would do that. Mm. Of course, it makes sense. They'd get a higher percentage of the money from the work and they'd get paid all, you know, they wouldn't have to uh, accept a, a salary. Um, so the only way to get them not to leave is to create a culture at the law firm that was so excellent, so good for them that they didn't want to leave, mm -hmm. you know? So I basically had to give them the power to have direct client relationships and have it be that they wanted to stay because it was such a great culture for them. So how did they do that? Well, I trained them really, really. First of all, I picked great associates. I learned to really interview carefully because I hated firing people and I had to do that sometimes mm -hmm. uh, when I had someone who wasn't very good and didn't want their success for themselves as bad as I wanted it for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes that happened and I... Um, and I had to fire people and that was awful and I hated it. So I started interviewing very, very, very carefully. And I specifically didn't interview, I, I, I didn't interview for sort of experience. I started interviewing more and more for character, you know, to get the kinds of people who I knew would want to do really, really well and mm. were ambitious and motivated and, and hospitable and charismatic and, and high energy and happy and enthusiastic and those kinds of things. So anyway, I started hiring better. And once I hired the people, I would work very, very, very hard to train them to be excellent young lawyers. Well, young lawyers want to be trained. They want to become excellent. And so that since I was putting all my time into training them, they liked that. Then I would pay them a good salary, but I would give them incredible bonuses when they, uh, they would do great work. Mm -hmm. And so they knew that I would reward them. So they weren't afraid that they were going to go without reward if they did great work. And then I gave them direct, like I said, direct client contact. I would actually introduce them to the client and say, hey, this is the young associate who will be taking care of you. You know, you probably won't need me. I'm around if you need me. I'm certainly there if the associate has questions. But, you know, just go ahead and develop a relationship there. Well, that happened. And these young associates who develop relationships with loads and loads of clients, I would have less need to be involved directly in each matter, which meant that I could develop more clients, uh, develop new areas of practice, say yes to more new cases, mm -hmm. and um, basically grow personally as a lawyer as well into new areas of practice. And so, um, the need to build, I, I built a great culture, not because I thought, gee, I'm going to build a great culture. I built a great culture because I needed to build a great culture in order to continue to be successful growing my practice. It was that simple. It was out of absolute necessity. And that necessity pushed me off my ego where I decided, where I had this great big bell ring in my mind. And this is one of the biggest bells that's ever rung in my life. And it was this, wait a minute, you know, becoming the very, very best lawyer that I can be and doing more and more hard work and making it all about me being excellent was actually a less desirable thing than to actually bring in young people, excellent p people with a lot of potential and make them excellent. Mm. So I finally saw that it was a more powerful thing for me to do in life to make others better than just to keep making myself incrementally better or work incrementally harder. I got to the point where I couldn't work a lot harder. I was working all the time. So I had to find a way to make others better. Yeah. And so that thing about making others better, making others better. And then what I soon learned is that was really immensely satisfying, making others better training them, teaching them, you know, mentoring them, um, helping them emotionally, helping them as a person, just trying to make them the strongest version of themselves I could. And then, of course, the benefit was that strongest version of themselves, which was already a great person, uh, became a wonderfully powerful asset to the law firm. Well, uh, during that time, I was doing lease work for Chipotle um, and started to do more and more stuff for Chipotle because it was a young company and I did things very, very inexpensively. Mm. Uh, if I got into that story, it was actually absurdly inexpensively looking back um, because I wanted to take care of Chipotle and it was a very young company. They only had um, uh, eight stores when I started doing the lease work. 
And, uh, and Steve Ells was, was a friend of mine. And Steve started, you know, he came over to the law firm to talk with me and we were both very excited, myself about the young law firm that I was continuing to build and Steve about his young burrito chain that he was continuing to build. And we, uh, we had a great time talking about it, and we were really enthusiastic for ourselves, but also for one another's success because mm -hmm. we were doing something very different. He was building this company where he sold burritos. I was building a law firm, very different businesses. Um, but yet any business can and should benefit from an excellent culture. And what Steve, when Steve came over to the law firm, he started to say, man, what is it? What, how do you do this? The culture here is great. Like these people are working really hard, but they're stoked and they're, and they're having, I don't know if Steve said the word stoked, that may be my word, but he was like, God, they're really enthusiastic. You know, they, they they seem really smart. They're, they'd come into my office and they'd meet Steve and, oh, hey, Steve. And they were all excited. He's like, God, these are great people. How'd you do this? And, you know, I, I don't know if I explained how I did it initially as well as I did just to you. I just sort of said, oh, I don't know, you know, we're working hard here, you know, <laughs> And uh, but he really kept no, no, really. How did you do it? And so I stopped and sort of said, well, let me tell you how I did it. And I explained it to Steve. And mm -hmm. so he and I would start talking about culture. And he's like, hey, how about if you come to Chipotle and build this kind of culture? And I was like, oh, gosh, that's really flattering. Thank you. But gosh, I love what I'm doing here. And but, you know, we continued to talk about this. But over the course of the next five years, he continued to sort of up the ante. No, really. No, really. Come to Chipotle. No, really. Come to Chipotle. <laughs> and and eventually he. Um, you know, he offered me sort of various officer positions and he said, hey, why don't you be the real estate director? And I said, well, that sounds like a lot of travel. And I just had young kids. And mm -hmm. so I kind of waited on that. And then he said, how about come be chief administrative officer was the next thing he and I said, well, I don't even know what that means. Administrative <laughs> officer, but administration doesn't sound very fun. And I'm like, what does that do? And he's like, oh, I don't know. But it's a cool, you know, you'll get in, you'll do good with it. And I was like, OK, well, I don't know. Anyway, over time. But eventually he said, hey, how about you just come run the company? Because I, you know, I would, you know, I. I've been doing this a long time and, and uh, I think you could build a great culture at Chipotle and it would really help us. And, and I still sort of, uh, and I thought, God, it's flattering. It sounds wonderful. I loved Chipotle. It sounded like a great opportunity, but I was really reticent to leave my law firm. But then Steve said something that, that actually was, and I'm not sure, he, you know, you know, he said a lot of smart things, but this was probably the thing that most powerfully caused me to decide to give it a shot to run Chipotle. And that is, he said, Monty, you think you're a great lawyer. He goes, but really what you are is a great leader. Mm. And if you come to Chipotle, you know, instead of the, at that point, maybe at our law firm, we had 30 or 40 employees at, at that point, maybe more than that. Maybe it was 50 by then. I don't know. But anyway, I don't remember the total number of employees, but basically Chipotle was like, hey, we're up to like 8,000 or something, you know, mm. by the time we were at this point. And I'm like, wow. And he said, yeah, you have an opportunity to come change, change and affect that many people's lives. You know, why don't you try it? And eventually, long story short, I said, okay, you know, and, and, uh, but during that time I had become general counsel during that 10 year period of time of starting at the law firm and going to Chipotle, um, I had, uh, and I'd been a lawyer before that in LA, but I was talking about the one law firm in Denver mm -hmm. where I was. So that 10 years, during that 10 years, um, I had become general counsel of Chipotle. I literally had a business card that said Monty, uh, Chipotle, Monty Moran general counsel, even though I really wasn't an employee of Chipotle yet. So <laughs> for, yeah, so for many years I was general counsel of Chipotle and I spent, and, and the deal there was um, the then chairman of Chipotle um, uh, told me he wanted me to spend uh, which is a guy named Jeff Kindler. Um, he told me, hey, I, I, you know, you should spend like, try to spend like 16 hours a week um, of your time at Chipotle. And so they gave me an office at Chipotle and a desk at Chipotle because he said, hey, the more you're there, the more you'll be able to help the company with various problems that come up. People will feel quicker to come approach you and just drop things on your desk. And mm -hmm. so the agreement was when, he, when they made me general counsel, I'd have to have an on-site presence of 16 hours a week. So I said, okay, cool. So I did that for uh, for quite a long time. And then uh, it was in it was from that position that I made the jump to to become president and COO, which after a couple of years became co-CEO of Chipotle. So wow. that's how I came to be there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but but, there, but it was a slower transition than it sounds in the sense that before I went over to be at Chipotle, Steve had asked me to come to all the board meetings. And then I was doing the note, the um, the minutes for the board meetings as the lawyer. And so then uh, and then he asked me to come to all the leadership meetings, which is where you have the, the top leaders of the company, that usually something, maybe 16, 18 people. And I would go to all those meetings. And then Steve noticed that at those meetings, I was very participative. I mean, I was very participative. I, mm -hmm. I'm a guy with a lot of opinions and a big mouth and I'm not afraid to speak. And so I did. And he really appreciated that. He appreciated the fresh look at things. And he I think you very much uh, continued to want me to be involved. And so yeah. ultimately, I, uh, I agreed to jump on board. Wow. What a great story. And, you know, I'm really happy that you unpacked all of that because I think it's really great context for our listeners as we go on to talk about your leadership style, your new book, um, and some of, some of this other stuff. There's a few themes in there that I, I want to dig into. So, you know, you started off as a lawyer. You then started working at Chipotle. Um, a lot of your responsibilities had to do with like real estate leasing and things that you didn't really know about yet. Uh, the food industry obviously was totally different than the law industry. So that was a whole different move. 
um, especially women, especially nowadays, um, um, they have imposter syndrome, right? They're worried about taking on a role <laughs> that they don't exactly have the credibility or, you know, the resume on paper to back up. So how did you, you know, go for it in terms of, you know, working at Chipotle, helping out Chipotle, even though you didn't have the relevant experience, how did you have the confidence to kind of learn as you went along? Wow. You know, well, first of all, with regard to imposter syndrome, you said a lot of women have imposter syndrome. I didn't know that that was a particularly woman thing, but I can tell you I have I have imposter syndrome really badly. You know, and I always have. So <laughs> so maybe that's part of my very maybe it's my feminine side, which I think I have a large feminine side. But anyway, um, so uh, I've always had that. And and so, you know, I, I think my willingness to do more and more and more work for Chipotle arose a lot more from my from my need to please and be useful than it did from any particular confidence that I'd be great. Mm. So in other words, when Steve asked me to do real estate leases, I said, oh, cool. Yeah, I'd like to do that. But then I ran to the library and spent literally weeks at the University of Colorado Law Library reading every book on real estate leasing that I could find. I mean, like and like taking notes and I mean, really, like all my time. And I didn't bill any of that time to anybody. You know, we couldn't bill the Chipotle. It wouldn't be fair because I was trying to get smart. Um, and then I talked to my partner, Ron Reeves, who was a real estate lawyer, and I learned from him. And, uh, and uh, well, actually, I said I talked to my partner. He wasn't even my partner yet. He was a partner. I wasn't. But I talked to who, the man who became my partner, Ron Reeves, mm -hmm. and learned about as much as I could about real estate law. And I just became a sponge and tried to learn, 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 learn. And then the first few, you know, I did these leases for a flat fee, which ended up being a $1,200 flat fee. And the funny thing there is I think it took me 100 hours at least to do each lease initially because there was a lot. It wasn't just the lease. There was a lot more associated with it, like real, you know, like um, site assessments and uh, and uh, environmental uh, impact statements and, and uh, super fund information about sites that had pollution and this and that. So there was a lot to it. And and I was going through all this stuff with a fine tooth comb and trying to learn, learn, learn. And I didn't really care about my billings. I didn't care about whether I made money. I just wanted to please Chipotle, please Steve, help Steve, help the company and uh, and be uh, be someone who they were glad. I, I want every job I've ever had. I wanted to prove to my boss or my client that they made the best decision in the world to hire me. And I've been willing to break my back to prove that. So, I mean, even when I started out at Dairy Queen, um, or that wasn't even my first job, but it was my first like W-2 job where I had, you know, withdraw withholding taxes and all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was 15, 15 years old. I had to be 15 to get the job. As soon as I turned 15, I, I got the job at Dairy Queen. And I felt so lucky to have that job, which I got paid, I think it was $2.45 an hour. And I felt so lucky to have that job. I couldn't believe someone was paying me. So I felt like I want to prove to them that they made a great decision to hire me. And I worked there for years while I was in high school. And, and then my next job, I was a janitor and I wanted to prove they made the best decision to hire a janitor ever. And so every job I've had, and I've had a whole bunch of jobs that, that people would call quote unquote dead end jobs. There's no such thing as a dead end job. In fact, I've learned so much from my so-called dead end jobs that, that I call them in my book, my minimum wage MBA. I mean, it's like I learned <laughs> a ton working at these places. And so to me, there was no job that wasn't good enough for me. It was almost like the opposite. I was so afraid I wasn't going to be good enough for any job, whether that be Dairy Queen, being a janitor, let alone being a lawyer, starting to do work for a young Chipotle Mexican grill which even though it was a very small company, I had all the confidence in the world it would be successful because it was so delicious. And Steve was, you know, such a visionary and 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 uh, was, you know, he was hell bent to make it a really successful company. And yeah. I thought that he was going to do that. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So anyway, um, so it's not that I had such confidence. It's that I was going to please them, yeah. you know, and I was going to work myself to death to do it. And and so in doing that, I think I just kept surprising people. I kept surprising and maybe even myself, but I kept surprising people with doing a great job and getting involved and trying to help them and making sure that whatever I build them was like they got way more value than I build them. And I carried that through my entire life. I mean, I've always tried to be of more value to whoever hires me than they pay me. Yeah. And uh, that, that helps. So you have a quote in your book. I think it summarizes it really well. You say, to this day, when people ask me about the secret of my success and how I can get ahead in life, I tell them, don't worry about getting ahead. Totally focus on what you're doing right now. Do it very well with all your passion and energy. People will notice, and when they do, they'll want more of your time. So it's not about you actually having the experiences, having the knowledge, the exact you know experiences of the past to implement in the future. It's really about having the attitude, the right attitude, and having good intentions to do well. And I, I follow the same strategy, and I always excel when I do that. Just having good intentions. Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. If your goal is to, if your goal is to really help someone and really take care of them. And make sure that their association with you is something that is great for them. Mm -hmm. um, how can you, how can you fail? 
if you think about it, right? Like if you don't provide that much value, well then don't bill them as much or work harder or, you know, it's like, so yeah, this idea. And I think that a lot of young people now, and I was just talking to my oldest son the other day and he's at that point of having graduated from college. He did well in college and he's looking for a job. And he's like, dad, it's really hard to find a job right now. And you know, there's tons of people like out of work and you know, and, and I don't even know how good I'll be at these jobs. And what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? And I was like, get a job, like any job, get a really bad one. You know, get one where you're sure <laughs> that you can succeed, they'll be lucky to have you, and then work so hard at it that you blow them away. Like, that you're, you're like, holy crap, I mean, this kid's flipping burgers, but man, he makes great burgers and he makes a lot of burgers and he does it with love and care, you know? Yeah. And I said, and then what happens is, what happens then is your confidence builds because you start being good at something. And if you're good at something, I don't care what it is, if someone is good at something, they get confidence that they can be good at something else. Yeah. And they can go to that something else. And then they get good at it and then they get confidence. Oh, I'm, I've been good at two things now. I, maybe I can be good at a third and then they're good at a third and then they're good at a fourth and they're good at a, and eventually they get a string of being good at stuff. Yeah. And when you're good at lots of things, you can be good at more things and you get confidence that, Hey, I'm, I'm useful. I can help people. I've got, and you start to actually accumulate real skill. And then that skill, well, then it just, it just, uh, snowballs, you know, it just, uh, you know, it just keeps getting uh, more and more powerful. Yeah. Take heed to what he's saying, everyone. Monty is giving really great advice in terms of how to just succeed. It's not about, you know, everything that you know and, and what you have on paper. It's about your attitude and the effort that you give. So let's talk about um, your role as CEO. Um, I read in your book that when you first started, you immediately decided to go undercover. So tell us about yeah. why you went undercover and some of the lessons that you learned there. Well, listen, this was a company that by the time I joined officially as an employee, as a W-2 employee, after having been general counsel for the better part of a, a decade, you know, when I, when I officially joined, there was like 8,000 employees and like 350 or 400 stores or something. I forget the exact number, but there was a lot of restaurants, right? And so I went in there and I, and I thought, what's, you know, what can I really do to help this company? You know, I mean, I can't go in and clean every store. There's hundreds of them. I can't go in and make sure the food's good. There's, you know, there's a hundred thousand customers, hundreds of thousands of customers every day. So um, what could I do? Well, I, I, I thought, well, the one thing I could do is really understand how we're training our managers, because if the general manager was excellent in any given store, that store would hire great people, produce great food, serve quickly, have great customer service and do all the things that would make Chipotle successful. So I said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and go through our management training and see how we train these people, you know, because I did, I did already have a, a, you know, an understanding that some managers were really good, but a lot of them weren't so great. And so how can I make them all great? So I thought, well, the first thing I better do is find out how we're training them. So I asked Gretchen Selfridge, who was a woman who was at that time, a regional director. So she had, you know, a whole bunch of stores reporting to her, maybe it's at that time, 60 or 80 stores. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, can you find a restaurant where you can put me in as an MIT trainee? Because that's what we called managers who we hired off the streets, usually with fast food experience. And we put them in as trainees. And then after a six week training program, they would become managers and go off to usually a new Chipotle or a Chipotle that needed a manager and become the general manager. Mm. And so I said, hey, can you put me in as a, like as a fake MIT train, well, a real MIT trainee, but I want people to not know who I am. I don't want them to know that I'm the new president and COO of the company, which was my title at that time. Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah, I can do that. And so we found a store where no one knew who I was except the general manager. And she was told, and her name was Kay and she's fabulous, great trainer, really neat. She was, she sat me down the first day, goes, okay, I know you're president and stuff. So I'm just going to do this. Like, I'm not going to tell anybody and I'm going to train you. And I'm going to like, I'm really going to train you. Like I train in the normal person. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want. She's like, I mean, but I'm going to, like, I'm going to be tough on you. I'm like, good, good. Be tough on me. Like, just don't, I don't want any positive. I don't want any, what do you call it? Leeway. You know, advantage. Mm -hmm. I don't want any leeway. It's like, I want you to beat me up and make me a good manager. Okay. And you know what? She did. I mean, she, she didn't beat me up, but I didn't make her have to. I worked really hard. You know, it's like, I was really motivated to get to be a great manager at Chipotle. So I knew what I was doing. And so anyway, I went through that program and it was awesome. But one, but I learned some things that weren't really part of the training program. Okay. So one thing I learned was that the crew people who we had working there at this time, it was a largely Hispanic crew. In fact, 86 or 87% of our workforce nationwide was Hispanic mm -hmm. at, in the, at that point. So it was a largely Hispanic workforce. Most of them didn't speak English. And I spoke this little tiny bit of like crummy Spanish, but I'd work it through and I, we'd, we'd communicate. And so I would ask the crew people and keep in mind, that's who was training me really. Like Kay was the responsible for training me, but she would set me up with a person to help me show me how to cut onions. And that was a crew person. She would set mm -hmm. me up with a person to show me how to use the grill. That was a crew person. She would show me, have someone show me how to do an inventory. That was a crew person. So I was really being trained by the crew people. 
And what I learned really quickly is these crew people were awesome. They were really smart. They were really cool. They were super ambitious. Um, to, and ambitious not to get ahead because they didn't know they could, but ambitious to deliver great, a great customer experience, to cook great food, to be the best grill cook, to be the best person slicing onions, the best prep cook, you know, mm -hmm. um, the best at cleaning, the best at doing an inventory. They were really great. And, and I was like, man, these people are awesome. Like, they're so much better than I will be in six weeks, like, because they've done it for years. And so anyway, so I learned, wow, these people are awesome. And so I'd ask them, I'd ask the crew people, hey, so what do you want to do? Like, do you want to be a manager here someday? And they'd be like, and they'd look at me like, yeah, the exact way that if I said to you, you know, hey, Holly, do you want to be a man? Do you want to win the lottery? You'd be like, um, yes. What's the trick? Like, what's the catch? Mm, Why are you asking mm -hmm. me that? Do you know what I mean? And so like, if you want to win the lottery, yeah, I want to win. But are you saying, I mean, I'm not going to win the lottery, you know? So why are we talking about this? So that's the way they looked at me like, yeah, sure. I'd like to be a manager, but like, and so they'd say, well, I said, well, what do you want to do in five years? Oh, I'll just keep doing this. Great. I love my job. No, but would you like to be a manager? Um, yeah, but they had no thought that there was any possibility of becoming a manager. And I thought, well, that's wrong because these people I very quickly knew would be a much better general manager than I would be after six weeks, mm. you know? And what we were doing at that time is we were hiring people with fast food experience, the vast, vast majority of which were, were white people um, to go in, train with the largely Hispanic crew to become managers. And I thought, well, this is wrong. You know, it doesn't make any sense. So I made up my mind right then, hey, why don't we train these crew people to be our future managers? Like all of our managers in the future should come from crew because these people are better. You already know a bunch mm -hmm. of things about them, don't you? Before you don't, you, Will they be a good manager? Well, you don't know for sure, but you do know they show up on time every day. You don't, you don't, because they've worked for you for two, three, four years, right? So you know they're going to show up on time every day. You know they have a great attitude. You know they're a hard worker. You know that they are really nice. You know that they care. You know they've got integrity. You know that they're honest. I mean, that's 99% of the battle. Can you teach them to be a manager? That's the easy part. That's the easy part, you know, teach them mm -hmm. how to use the keys to open the front door, teach them how to hire someone, fire someone, onboard someone, teach them how to, you know, deal with really sophisticated customer service complaints or problems, you know, they can learn all that. I mean, good Lord, they can learn it easily. So, so very quickly during my training, I said um, to Steve and the other officers, I said, Hey, we got to get rid of this MIT training program and stop hiring people with, ex you know, experience off the streets. And, and instead we got to rely on our crew people. And that's going to do a ton of things that are going to help our company. You know, number one, we can stop hiring people with experience. Cause what is that experience? Fast food experience. Well, is fast food experience really good experience? Did we think of any other fast food restaurant as having awesome people, especially these are people who don't work there anymore, who mm -hmm. couldn't maybe hold their job at a Taco Bell or whatever, you know? And so we're hiring the people who aren't the best, fast food workers for fast food experience. And we don't even value the experience they've had because the experience they've had might be that they were operating something you know, mess, messy and serving bad food and giving bad service. Yeah. So why look for that? Why look for that? Why not look for someone with character, which is the one thing you can't train. You can't train character. That's up to your parents when you're one year old, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, right? And so you either have that or you don't by the time you come in as a 18 or 19 or 20 year old person for an entry level job at Chipotle. Like mm -hmm. you have that character or you don't. If you're dishonest, I can't train you to be honest, can I? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Did I train you to be happy or enthusiastic or motivated? Probably not. So I said, hey, if we hire everyone from crew, here's what's going to happen. First of all, we're going to inject so much enthusiasm into our crew because they're going to be like, man, uh, these people care about us. They believe in us. There's a chance to move up. And guess what they're going to do, especially in the Hispanic community where there's a lot of people with large families. They're going to tell their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and moms and dads and say, hey, man, you should work. This is awesome. This is a great job. They're, we're going to move up. I'm going to move up at this job. And the word's going to get out through not just the Hispanic community, but through all communities um, that, hey, Chipotle is a place where if you get a job there, even at the entry level, you're going to become a manager, right? So we're going to mm -hmm. have more enthusiasm at the crew level. We're going to have more people applying for jobs. We're going to have more people to pick from in terms of choosing who our future leaders are. We're going to have uh, much, 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 much better managers. And then I actually went back to the corporate office when I came up with this thought and looked at the data. I looked, are there any people who have gone from crew positions to manager positions? Well, mm -hmm. there were very few, okay? Statistically very few, there was, but there were still dozens and dozens that had. I looked at their performance versus the performance of people hired from the outside. And what I found was that the people who came from the inside, that is to say from crew positions, had a had much, much, much better restaurants, ran better operations, and were, and were uh, four times less likely to leave. The mm -hmm. turnover was four times less. So I thought, well, this is a home run. Anyway, so we started doing that. We got, and over time, I said, within two years, we're going to hire 100% of the people from within. And we might not have achieved 100%, but we achieved like you know, 80 or 90% in two years. And within a few years after that, we were like 95% hired from within. And the only exceptions to that were we'd find someone who was a hot shot 
at you know, a Starbucks and say, hey, come to Chipotle or wherever. You yeah. know, someone would get to know someone. So one of our people would get to know someone and say, hey, come to Chipotle and we'll train you real quick to be a manager. And we'd, we'd fast track a few people. But almost everyone else came from a legitimate crew position into management, management positions. And it was a home run for our company. Yeah. Well, you clearly have some great leadership skills. You clearly know how to empower people, make them motivated. Um, really cool stuff here. Um, let's talk about your leadership style. So your book, which is coming out, when is it coming out exactly? The is 20th it, of October. So it's just a few days here. Uh, yeah. Tuesday. Okay. Tuesday. I, I think I'm going to put out this episode Monday, so it'll be right on time. <laughs> to help you promote your new book. It's called Love is Free, Guac is Extra, How Vulnerability, Empowerment, and Curiosity Built an Unstoppable Team. So I definitely wanna dig into all of this stuff. Let's start off with your definition of leadership. I know you have a unique definition of leadership. What is that at a high level? Yeah, so basically I look at management and leadership as totally different things. And most people just, you know, we talk about managers, managers, even though we even kept the general manager label, but we really didn't want man general managers to manage. We wanted general managers to lead. So basically management is, is, is about getting someone to do what you want them to do. You mm -hmm. know, like, hey, I want you to keep this restaurant clean. I want you to serve good food. I want you to give good customer service. Please do that. Thank you. You know, that's management, right? And the people who can do that well are, are, are valued in our society. But leadership, is, is something much more powerful and much more enlightened. In leadership, leadership is about getting someone to do something that they themselves find value in, that they want to do for themselves, that also happens to advance the cause of, you know, the organization, Chipotle in this case, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So you have to find, I have to find something in you, you know, that I have to know you, I have to care about you enough to know what makes you tick to know what like really fires you up, to know what excites you, to know what brings the best out of you, okay? And once I find that about you, I find out where does that dovetail with what our organization needs? And the answer is usually that there's an enormous overlap, right? Like I can do, I can do something that's gonna help you become a, the most powerful version of yourself while simultaneously advancing the organization immensely, mm -hmm. okay? So that's where leadership is. It's at that juncture between finding what you're passionate about and what's gonna make you have a great life and enthusiastic, fun, excited life where you're at your very, very best, and the thing that actually helps my organization or the thing that the boss, quote unquote boss or leader is in charge of also have a huge advantage yeah. from your work. OK, so it's a win win. It's about finding that win win. Yeah. And that's leadership. I think that's an excellent definition of leadership. So when you are at um, Chipotle, you actually had a reputation of having these really great one on one calls with your employees. So there was like 75,000 employees who worked at Chipotle. And I think you had 20,000 one on one calls. Um, this reminds yeah. me of somebody named Claude Silver. I'm not sure if you know who she is. She's, I don't. The, she's a chief heart officer of Vayner Media, Gary, Gainer, Vayner, Gary Vaynerchuk's uh, like right hand woman uh, at the company. And cool. um, she has a goal of like touching every employee and they basically have a role designed for her to connect with employees. And basically it sounds like she had like a very similar job to what you had at Chipotle, um, only they call it like a chief heart officer. So there's obviously a trend out there in terms of, you know, connecting with your employees and things like that. So why do you think that having a strong culture is an important aspect to having a well-run company and uh you know why did you decide that that was something that you needed to kind of take over at chipotle yeah well first of all that's a cool chief heart officer that sounds cool and i'd love to meet her that's really neat um it sounds like she's doing something great you know um at chipotle we well we had seventy five thousand employees uh you know in 2015 i think um, in 2016, I grew about 75,000 at that time. Uh, we were hiring though, it's a very high turnover business, even though we had lower turnover than all of our uh, peers, it's still over 100% a year. Mm. You know, oh, you wow. lose that, that hourly position. So we were hiring 100,000 people a year, okay? 100,000 people hiring a year. So, um, but what I did, I didn't have phone calls with people. I sat down one-on-one -on -one with people. I was traveling to restaurants mm. all over the country and every time I went to any restaurant, I had a rule. I mean, I would sit down with every single person, one-on-one -on -one, at a table and talk to them. And some of these conversations were five, 10 minutes and some were, three hours in the rare case, you know, but it just depended what I was learning. And, and, and a few things happened during that. Okay. So I, first of all, I really got to know people and what really drove them. I got to know what they loved about the job, what they didn't like about the job, what, what we were doing well in the restaurants, what we were doing poorly in the restaurants, what our best leaders were doing really, really well. And what our worst leaders were doing that wasn't helping. 
And so I got an understanding of the entire leadership structure of the company. I got an understanding of the operational spe specifics of the company. I got an understanding of the individual people in the company, the kinds of people we were hiring, whether we were making the right hiring decisions, whether we were training them properly, landing, landing them in the job properly. In other words, what did we do on their first day? Did we give them something, a really encouraging first day that, that made them feel good and welcomed and valuable, or didn't we? So that and a million other things I would learn from doing these conversations. So these, even though I was CEO of the company or co-CEO, these conversations, which took you know a, a large percentage of my time, maybe it was 30 or 40 percent of my time, I was in these conversations. But guess what? During that 30 or 40 percent of my time, of my time that I was actually talking one on one with people, I was learning how to run the company better, how to be more efficient, how to how to waste less food, how to buy better food, how to prepare the food better, what techniques were best, how to run the restaurants better, what equipment to buy, what equipment not to buy, how to calibrate the equipment, how to how to treat the equipment so it would last longer. I mean, and a million other things. OK, lots and lots yeah. from which I was able to uh, as I left every restaurant on almost every occasion after every visit, I would leave that restaurant a really understanding the people in the restaurant, understanding mm -hmm whether it was run as well as it could be, understanding whether the operations were excellent, understanding whether it had a great leader. But I'd also understand something global about what we could do better as a company. And I would call whoever is in charge of that particular uh, skill, whether mm -hmm. it be if it was someone who's in charge of, you know, of operations or an operations officer or, or a restaurant, one of our uh, regional directors, I'd say, hey, let's get the regional director together and talk to them. We're going to change the way we cut an onion because we can save, you know, we can use 10% more of the onion and have much better cut sizes, which would yield a much more delicious food by doing this one thing differently everywhere. So even though it was very specific, when you roll that out over what ended up being when I was there two, over 2000 restaurants, small changes make for huge, huge savings or huge, huge benefits to the customer. So that was, that was just really, really awesome. And so I just went and I sat down with people at every restaurant and I would, and it wasn't like I went there and quizzed them about something specific or said, Hey, how can we do better? I, I would first of all, just go, Hey, hi, you know, how are you? And so, you know, how, how do you like it here? What's it like? And, and I'd get to know them personally by getting to know people personally and, and actually caring about them and caring about who they are, who, what their heart feels like, how they feel being at, at Chipotle, you know, whether it's helping them become a better person, a happier person, a more fulfilled person, whether it's helping them be a better father, a better mother, sister, daughter, brother, whatever. Um, you know, it's like so I would sit down with these people and just really work on helping them be at their best. And they were blown away. I mean, people would all tell me, oh, my God, I can't believe you're the CEO. Like, I, like why, I didn't think you'd be like this. I thought you'd be like, I was like, well, what do you think I'd be like? Well, I didn't think you'd be like such a normal person, you know? And I'd be like, well, OK, <laughs> cool. Well, I'm glad I'm a normal person. And, and it was like people expected that because I was in the top job in the company that I would have some sort of air of superiority. Well, it's not just that I didn't have an air of superiority. I know I'm not superior. There's nothing superior about me. I just had more time in the job and I had more experience and I had worked really hard and I'm older, you know? Yeah. It's like, I'm not, I wasn't superior to anybody. I, in fact, a lot of these people, I was like blown away by, I mean, each and every one of them, I was blown away by something. Like they're better. I was like, wow, they're so articulate. Or some people I was like, oh, wow, they're so sweet. Or that, oh, wow, they have such, the way they look at you with their eyes is so nice. I feel like safe, you know, that kind of, so people have all these different characteristics. And basically by finding out their, the beauty of individual people and understanding them and actually learning and, and loving them. I mean, you can't help but love someone when you really get to know them and understand what's in their heart. It's very hard not to love them. So basically people found out that I love them. And when, and when I love them, they were like, oh man, this is awesome. The, even the CEO, like he loves me and he loves this company, he loves this culture. And so people began, began to really believe in the culture as something real. You know, they believed in the, that the company actually was, uh, you know, a company of people who cared about them. And so then the more importantly than my own interviews, the most important thing I did was to teach the hundreds and hundreds of field leaders how to sit down, how to have these conversations, how to learn to actually really care about the human beings, because by caring about the human beings, you get much, much better operations. You know, you get much, much better financial performance, all the things that the shareholders wanted, you'd get the most of that. Yeah. Way. And I think people probably felt really valued because, you know, I've worked at HP, I work at Disney streaming now, and having a conversation with the CEO is like unheard of, like unless you're an SVP or a senior level executive, you know, you're not really getting airtime with the CEO. And so that must right. have made them feel really valued, really heard. And that's really important when it comes to motivating your employees. So I think that was an excellent Absolutely. strategy. Yeah, and it, it was. And everybody, and I don't care what at what position you're in. Everyone actually works better from a position of passion and, and, and uh, a desire to do well, knowing that they can do well in a sense, it, when they're empowered, basically. And my definition of empowerment is feeling confident in your ability and encouraged by your circumstances, such that you feel motivated and at liberty to fully devote your talents to a purpose. So people are at their best when they're confident in their ability 
and encouraged by their circumstances. So confident in your ability is pretty easy. You train someone so they know what they're doing. That's it's kind of that simple. And I talk about it in my book, but I don't make it that much more complicated even in my book. The harder part is creating encouraging circumstances. So when are your circumstances encouraging? Well, if you ask anyone that, you ask them to really think about it and to think about someone around whom you feel at your best. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I feel that way around my father or my mother or my sister, or my best friend. Um, and, uh, and some people say, well, my father makes me feel terribly unempowered. But, you know, it's, it's all over the gamut, right? But someone, you can always think of someone around whom you feel at your best, right? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what that person is doing is creating encouraging circumstances and the way they're always doing it. And it's almost always the same. Well, it's always the same anywhere. It's that they care about you, believe in you, come to know you, want what's best for you, challenge you you know, uh, won't stop until they see you at your best, right? So you're the person you feel the best around isn't someone if you're, you know, um, you know, if you come home, like you like say, it's your your parents, you know, if you're a 15 year old kid, and you come home, you know, smoking a joint, a joint in your left hand and a scotch in your right hand, and your parents are like, hey, that's great, man, as long as you're happy, kid. Well, that's not what the parents going to say if they're an empower. That's not encouraging circumstances. That's like letting someone not be at their best. A great parent's not going to necessarily is not going to tolerate that, right? They're gonna be like, hey, wait a minute. You know, hey, you're a young person. You have a life ahead of you. Let's get you on the, you know, you got to do better. I, you know, you're really smart. You can do more than this. So it's not always going to be sweet and kind. It might be quite rigid and disciplined at times. But overall, that person's going to be someone who cares about you, believes in you, encourage, and wants you to be at your best and will not rest until you are at your best. Yeah. And that's encouraging circumstances, right? And so when I, when, when I uh, uh, started doing it myself and then trained the other hundreds of field leaders to do this, the whole culture became this place where we created encouraging circumstances. And in those encouraging circumstances, guess what? People are at their best. You know, a, a, a friend of mine um, recently wrote a book called Choose Love, Not Fear. And if you just think about that title, Choose Love, Not Fear. And it, too, is a leadership book that talks about a lot of the principles that I happen to cover in my book. And, and basically, you know, the point, you know, if you could summarize it, it's that, you know, when people are in fear, they don't work very well. They're not at their best. They're not they, they, they perform poorly. But when they're when they're feeling loved and cared for and then are also challenged. Right. It's not all about just love and kumbaya yeah. there's there's it's got teeth it's got teeth too right mm -hmm. like you're demanding that people do well you're going we got to do excellent work you've got to, and you also have to have a vision right to empower someone someone has to have a vision and work towards that vision and the vision can be very difficult to achieve a lot of these companies a lot of super ambitious uh companies that are performing incredibly but they have all the employees rowing in the same direction towards what might be a very difficult thing to achieve but something that everyone deems incredibly worthwhile you know, so it may be very hard, right? Like climbing Mount Everest, maybe your vision, it's hard, right? But you're going to, you, you think about the feeling you're going to, you're, how are you going to feel at the top and the sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. And so you're willing to work very hard to take very difficult steps through deep snow, through horrible freezing temperatures, through danger, what have you, to get to the top of that mountain. So it may be very difficult, but you're still encouraged by your circumstances because each step, you know, is getting you closer to your goal. Yeah. So I want to take a step back and talk about your teenage years. You mentioned previously you worked, you know, several years at Dairy Queen. And I read that yeah, you used to meet awesome. homeless people and hang out with homeless people at Dairy Queen. And I think that probably had a lot to do with your leadership style later on and influencing, you know, the way that you ended up leading and your need to kind of connect with people and have no judgment against people and, and being able to relate to them. So can you tell us about that story and, and maybe what you learned from it? Yeah, yeah, that was incredible. That was an awesome job working at Dairy Queen. And we were just uh, lucky uh, for a few reasons, I suppose. Um, but one reason we were lucky is that our Dairy Queen was located just a block away from two different mental health facilities. And so there was these homeless people uh, and most of them that came into Dairy Queen were mental health patients. And they would come in and they would usually buy a coffee. And that was it. And they'd sit around, they'd wrap themselves around that cup of coffee for two, three, four hours, sometimes all day, you know. Um, and uh, and so I would, during my breaks, I would just go say hi to them. Hey, you know, how are you doing? And, they, and a lot of them would look up and I think a lot of them were like, oh, good. Hi. You know, but you could tell they were actually like almost shocked that I took any interest, even enough to say hello. Um, I don't think many people saw value in them, which is mm. a horrible, horrible shame because they're incredibly valuable people. So I would sit down across from these folks and and uh, on my breaks, because I had 15 minute breaks like twice a day or whatever, and or on my lunch hour sometimes. So I'd take a whole lunch with them. And I would sit down and say, hey, so hey, how'd you come to be here? Like, where are you from? And they'd be like, oh, I'm at the mental health facility over there. And they might say that with some embarrassment, like, oh, is it cool? Like, is it, what's it like there? Like. And I was just super curious and I had no judgment, like no negative judgment. And that's something that I think just is broken in my brain. I don't have negative judgments about stuff that other people do. So I don't think it's bad to be homeless. Like, mm. just, it's only bad if someone's not enjoying it. 
right? Like, I don't think it's just inherently bad. Some, someone might choose to be homeless. I mean, when you go camping, you're homeless for a minute. Yeah. Some people like to camp. Some people like to camp six months at a time. That's homeless, kind of. I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to dumb down the problem and say it's not a problem. It is for a lot of people. But I just sort of said, hey, so like, where do you live? And they'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a home right now. I'm just, I stay in the, you know, I stay behind the, whatever, under the bridge. Oh, wow. Is it, what's that like? I mean, is it like, you have some freedom, I guess, right? And like, yeah, and they'd laugh. Yeah, I guess I'm free. You know, but uh, well, how do you like it? Well, I don't know. I guess I'd like to have, I'd like to have somewhere to live. Oh, wow. Well, so how are you going to do that? You know? And well, I don't know. I mean, right now it's really hard because blah, 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 blah. So I just talked to them and asked them and, and I learned how they got to be where they are, what their life was about, who they loved, you know, what had happened that led them to this place that was sometimes very difficult for them. And, and, uh, you know, and, and a lot of these folks were, um, they had maybe some dysfunction mentally. They were having a hard time um, and struggling. But I found such value in their struggle because I had had less struggle. I had come from a family where I knew where my next meal was coming from. Yeah. I knew that, you know, that generally speaking, I wasn't worried about my safety. I wasn't worried about a place to live. And so I learned so much from, you know, dozens and dozens of people who really were concerned about having a place to live, who really didn't know where the next meal was coming from, who were making maybe some really bad decisions, like buying cigarettes instead of food or, or you know, drinking only coffee and, and putting tons of creamer in it to get their calories. So I started like, you know, to say, hey, why don't you like, why don't I get you some food? And I bring them, you know, and I got to eat free food when I was at Chipotle. I mean, Chipotle. When I was at well, Chipotle too, but when I was a Dairy Queen, one of the things I loved about the job is they'd let me eat for free. And so I would bring, you know, my my lunch out and I would share it with them. And I'd go here, have half my hamburger. And they would eat it, you know, I'd eat it like you could tell they were hungry, you know, really hungry sometimes. And but then I would I would just notice that they would start to get nursed back to a better place as I'd talk to them day after day, week after week. And really I think most of the better place they were coming to wasn't because they were necessarily eating better, although some of them really started to prioritize like food instead of cigarettes, or maybe instead of a coffee, they'd get something to eat and get a chicken sandwich or whatever. Cause we had food at that Dairy Queen, mm -hmm. uh, not just, not just hot dogs, but you know, <laughs> burgers and chicken sandwiches, fish sandwiches, that stuff. And anyway, so, um, but I'd noticed that a lot of them would start to really like feel more confidence as they came and be happier. Their head would be held higher. They'd talk more to me. They'd take up more of the conversation. They, you'd see their confidence being restored. And I think the biggest thing that restored their confidence is just that like, I love them. You know, and they were seen and understood and valued. And in that being seen and understood and valued, those are parts of the things that I just said to you were part of encouraging circumstances. So all of a sudden, these people who were in maybe very not encouraging circumstances, very lonely, uh, hungry, you know, um, poor, uh, maybe not uh, not a lot of people that were caring for them or looking after them, maybe nobody. All of a sudden, there was at least one person, myself, who was like going, hey, how are you? And I knew their name. Hey, Tim, how are you doing today? It's great to see you. You, you look good today. Are you feeling better? Yeah, I'm feeling better. Oh, good. Uh, hey, I noticed you're not smoking. Well, I'm trying to give up cigarettes. Good for you, Tim. That's great. You know, and, and, I, and, and I was encouraging them and I cared about them and I knew them and I got to see who they really were. And I saw that the beauty in their hearts and having someone look into your eyes and see the beauty in your heart makes you see the beauty in your own heart. Mm -hmm. It starts to make you, it starts to heal you. It starts to make you feel better about the person you are. And guess what? You know, when you feel better about the person you are, then you are a more productive person who can add more value to the world around you, start helping others, and maybe even get paid for that or get a job Yeah, if you're a person without one. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off.